Till your lawn and up for more biodiversity. This is one of the presentations we are offering in the Focus on Sustainability webinar series. This series was developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on this series, the webinars expand the reach of our individual programs. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're all nonprofit and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Ecolandscape California. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Mark Richardson. Mark is the Director of Horticulture at the New England Wildfire Society and oversees Garden in the Woods, their botanic garden, and the Nasami Farm Native Plant Nursery. Mark studied ornamental horticulture at the University of Rhode Island and holds a master's in at the University of Delaware's Longwood graduate program. Prior to his current position, Mark spent several years working at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania, where he overhauled the curriculum of the professional gardener program. Mark is also a trustee on the Ecological Landscape Alliance Board of Directors. Welcome, Mark. Thanks a lot, Penny, and thanks for inviting me to uh, give this presentation today. This is one of my favorite talks, so uh, it's, it's definitely something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I've, I, uh, I studied urban horticulture at University of Rhode Island, and also uh, the, the degree that I, um, that I actually received from URI was a dual degree in urban horticulture and turfgrass management. Um, so I actually studied turfgrass quite a bit, and apologies for my uh, presentation there for a second, um, and but I've always just been really kind of, um, uh, I, I guess the, the best word is bored of the traditional American landscape, uh, you know, the one that we can pretty much see where no matter where we are in the U.S. Uh, I, I challenge you to um, figure out exactly where this image in this introductory slide was taken um, because it's, you know, it could it's anywhere USA essentially. Um, so as much as I, you know, studied and understand uh, turf grass management, um, it's always been something that I've, I've, I've um, uh, certainly shied away from, and my career has definitely brought me into different places. Uh, and I haven't really um, spent a whole lot of time on the uh, typical sort of mow and blow landscape crew. I've, I've tended to focus more of my uh, interest and attention on, uh, you know, the more interesting aspects of the garden. And so today what we're really going to be covering is um, – sort of a laundry list of things, but first uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go through some introductory slides to tell you a little bit more about New England Wildflower Society. I promise this will be pretty brief um, before we dive into the meat of the presentation. So I'm, uh, as Penny mentioned, I work for New England Wildflower Society. We oversee or operate Garden in the Woods, which is a, a native plant um, botanic garden in Framingham, Massachusetts. The society is about 100 years old. We were started by a group of really garden club women who were interested in uh, helping to preserve um, the native flora in New England. They saw that a lot of people were uh, harvesting flowers, wildflowers directly from the forests um, for the budding floral trade and, and really wanted to do, to do something about that to encourage people not to um, harvest, um, uh, you know, precious wildflowers from the from the woodlands around them, but to grow them in their gardens in, instead. So you saw seeing you saw signs like this one showing up around uh, the turn of the last century, so around 1900 is when the organization was really founded. And we've been, you know, operating uh, ever since. We have a, a pretty great mission statement uh, here. It's to conserve and promote the region's native plants to ensure healthy, biologically diverse landscapes. Um, and I, I promise not to speak this quickly once I dive into the meat of the presentation. Uh, we do this uh, in a number of different ways. We inspire people through uh, native plant horticulture at Garden in the Woods. We uh, grow uh, native plants primarily from wild collected seed at our nursery, Nasami Farm, that uh, Penny also mentioned. Uh, we write books. Um, so we, we published The Flora of New England um, back in 2011. This was uh, the result of about 10 years worth of research by our research botanist um, and publish uh, popular press books, you know, uh, gardening how-to manuals. In fact, a colleague of mine, Dan Jaffe, and I just finished writing a book called Native Plants for New England that's going to be published in March. Um, so definitely something to keep an eye out for. Um, we do a lot of teaching and outreach throughout uh, the six region, um, uh, six state region of New England. Um, but most of what we're probably known for, or what we're, we're probably best known for, is is our botanic garden, Garden in the Woods, which was started by a gentleman named Will Curtis in uh, 1931. 
Mr. Curtis was a landscape architect by training, um, studied at Cornell University, really was an avid uh, plantsman. Um, uh, he was not a great garden designer, but he built a really incredible and important garden here at Garden in the Woods, one that really focused on native plants at a time when people weren't really spending a whole lot of um, time and energy in, in researching or enjoying native plants. Um, and, you know, he, he basically spent a lifetime um, sort of building the antithesis of, of this landscape. Um, garden in the Woods is all about naturalistic uh, garden design, you know, meant to appear as if it grew out of uh, nature. Uh, whereas, you know, the traditional American landscape is one that's really sort of anti-nature, if you will. Uh, it's very sterile. It's really, you know, it's it's green, sure, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very boring and 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 sort of drab landscape. Um, and for you know, for whatever you might think about the person who who lives in this house uh, at the time, um, you know, it's it's this is the prototypical American landscape. This is what people really you know uh, aspire um, to be in in a lot of cases. You know, it's um, formal clipped hedges. It's you know freshly mown turf grass. Uh, it's lots of turf and trees and, you know, more turf. And unfortunately, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty um, uh, disastrous landscape. And you'll, you'll understand more about what I mean as we go through this presentation. Um, so before we really dive into uh, the, the, the meat of the, of the subject matter, I, I just wanted to kind of introduce a few ideas. Um, first is this one. This was an article that was published in the Washington Post back, back about uh, just a couple of years ago, so 2015. And this headline was really grabbing, and I thought it perfectly kind of summarized my thoughts about, uh, about lawn care. Lawns are a soul-crushing time suck, and most of us would be better off without them. The article was really great. Um, you know, I encourage you to go and look for it. Uh, it's still, you know, in the archive file. You can find it on WashingtonPost.com. Um, but, you know, what it really spoke to was this sort of love affair that Americans have with uh, this, this pristine, you know, clipped turf grass. Uh, and, you know, it, the article was different from other articles that you often see that talk about the environmental consequences of, of turf. It really talked about how you know, lawns aren't the greatest for our own personal well-being. Uh, you know, they, they are a soul-crushing time suck. The amount of time that's spent on lawn care in this country is, is astronomical. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I have much better things to do with my Saturday uh, than spend a couple of hours, you know, mowing and trimming and string trimming and, you know, fertilizing. And um, for all the environmental issues that there are with lawns, I have much better things to do with my time. Um, in fact, I'll just tell a quick story. This is, uh, I, have a, I have a friend in my neighborhood. I live in a pretty traditional suburban uh, neighborhood. Uh, the lots are pretty large. We're out in uh, kind of rural Massachusetts, uh, about an acre and a quarter altogether in my, in my neighborhood. And, you know, most of my neighbors have a lot of lawn. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and he was complaining about how much time his lawn really took him every single weekend. Uh, and really, I mean, this this is something that he was really upset about. He's got a great lawn. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing, he's got a really nice looking lawn. He spends a lot of time, uh, spends a lot of care and attention um, dealing with it. And the the bottom line uh, for him was not so much that he needs to reduce his lawn, um, but that he needs to uh, buy a bigger lawnmower. Uh, that was that was his solution to the amount of time that it took him. And I, unfortunately for a lot of us, I think that's what we what we jump to is not that you know I, I should really be thinking about limiting my lawn or maybe reducing it a little bit or reducing how much I'm watering it and fertilizing it and the amount of time that I have to have to spend dealing with it. I just need to buy bigger equipment, right? Uh, so I, I think what I'd like to do with this presentation is encourage you to strike up conversations with your friends uh, when they approach you with ideas like this and say, well, have you ever thought about maybe not having so much lawn and maybe planting a pollinator garden instead? Uh, you know, just really think about the amount of time that we spend um, dealing with these uh, with these uh, sort of unsustainable landscapes. Uh, it's not good for our souls, I'll say. Um, and finally, I just wanted to uh, mention a little bit about um, our, uh, just to kind of drive point, drive home the point of our obsession with lawn. Uh, many of you are, I'm sure, are familiar with the uh, National Mall. Um, this is uh, an image of the National Mall taken before uh, they undertook this major restoration um, uh, that's taken the last couple of years. Um, you know, this is Americans, America's front lawn. Uh, it's a very used, sort of used and abused landscape. Uh, really, it's, it, it, it's, 
lawn is not the right landscape treatment for the uh, National Mall because it gets so much use. You know, there's there's constantly events and uh, public events and protests and everything uh, on the National Mall. And so it looks like this, you know, a lot of soil compaction. Uh, it's it's uh, it's sort of loved to death, I'll say. Um, so for the last few years, the tr trust for the National Mall has been working on restoring the National Mall. Um, unfortunately, they never even thought about uh, considering, you know, a, a different landscape treatment than lawn. It was always going to be lawn. It has to be lawn because it's America. Um, and so this is what what they did. They spent about eight hundred and fifty million dollars altogether on restoring the lawn. Um, that involved re removal and replacement of, you know, six to ten feet of soil. Uh, along the stretch of the National Mall, installation of irrigation and drainage, and the installation of a 250,000 gallon uh, cistern to capture stormwater um, and to use for irrigating uh, the turf. Now, all these things are great. These are fantastic, sustainable practices. These are things that I certainly applaud them for. Um, but unfortunately, the only reason any of these things are necessary is because lawn is such an unsustainable landscape treatment. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't have to do this much um, to have a viable uh, landscape that would work in the nation's capital. Um, and so this was a huge project, uh, you know, took the, took the last two or three years to finally complete. Uh, and the bottom line is we got, you know, a lawn. Um, boring, sterile, unsustainable as much as, it, uh, as, much as they tried. You know, th this lawn is less bad than most lawns uh, because they're reusing stormwater for irrigation uh, and they, you know, chose uh, specific turf grass varieties that need less moisture, can tolerate more foot traffic. So they certainly did their best to be uh, less bad, but that's all they can really um, get uh, because they still chose a lawn. Um, and so now let's dive into what it is that's so bad about lawns. Um, so here's the rest of the program outline. What's so bad about my lawn? Um, hoping to give you, because I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, you know, already, are, you've already drank the Kool-Aid, you're already sort of anti-lawn, and, you know, maybe you need some more, uh, some more meat for the argument when you're, when you're speaking with your neighbors and your friends, um, and then we'll, we'll go through, okay, I, I understand my lawn's unsustainable, I understand there's some, you know, environmental consequences, that's great, but how can I sustainably rid myself of lawn? Um, and then finally, my lawn is gone. Now, what do I do? And so what I'd like to do is present a number of uh, native plant alternatives to the uh, traditional American lawn. So let's dive into this. Um, first, I think it's important that we establish what we mean by lawn. Um, I have a lot of green space around my around my house um, that I, you know, I, I mow, um, but I don't really consider it a, a lawn necessarily. It's a it's a great combination of wildflowers and, uh, you know, various cool season and warm season grasses, plenty of weeds, plenty of dandelions. My neighbors, you know, absolutely hate me um, for that reason. But, you know, this is what I'm really talking about. This is the kind of lawn that we should be trying to avoid at all costs. It's a monoculture of uh, cool season turf grasses. Um, most of them are native to Europe. Um, it's recreation space, so there's some, you know, advantages to a lawn. Uh, you know, I, it's tough to play soccer on wild strawberry, um, but there are lots of cases where we don't have to play soccer on that green space, and wild strawberry would certainly work. Um, so a lawn really is a space that's able to withstand repeated foot traffic. Um, we in the in the U.S. have about 40 million irrigated acres of lawn across uh, across the country. That's uh, you know nearly two percent of the total acreage of, of this of this country um, and all told we spend about 40 billion dollars a year on lawn care um, that's more than we spend on foreign aid now granted this isn't the u.s government spending this is private spending um, but that's a big chunk of change there's a lot of money uh, going toward um, uh, toward lawn care and i think that money is better spent uh, and just like your time is better spent um, doing other things in the garden um, so let's focus a little bit on what's so bad about my lawn. Well, first, I like to uh, uh, hammer on this issue as much as I can. First is water. Well, lawns are really, uh, uh, um, you know, water hogs. Um, because they're cool season turf grasses um, that are meant to go dormant in the heat of the summer, um, which doesn't really jive with our lifestyles and what we'd like to see from our lawns in the middle of the summer, um, we irrigate them. In the Northeast, we uh, about 30% of our potable water goes to irrigating lawns. Um, you see this if you're driving out in the, you know, uh, out anywhere um, in in the Northeast, 
um, you see lawn irrigation popping up in the morning. Uh, you know, it's pretty typical for people to water uh, water their lawns in those early parts of the day, uh, even if it's raining or not, even if we've had plenty of rain, uh, those lawn uh, sprinkler systems are going. And unfortunately, we, we waste a lot of water uh, that could otherwise be better spent. Um, as you drive further west, um, in the country, you see as much as 60% of uh, residential water use being dedicated to lawns. Um, that's just a, a ton of water. And when water is a scarce resource, as it is the further west you go in this country, uh, it's really an, a, 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 an unwise use of that uh, vital, vital resource. And it's really only necessary because these turf grasses are not adapted to our climate, or at least uh, what we're trying to get out of them is not well adapted to the climate in terms of trying to keep them green all summer. Um, in terms of pesticides, uh, this is the, you know, the piece of pollution that I think most people uh, harp on quite a bit. Um, perfection requires pesticides. It's, it's really hard to keep a pristine turf grass lawn without using some pesticides. Um, so we put about 30,000 tons of, uh, of various pesticide um, chemicals on our lawns each year. What I really like to do, because 30,000 tons is kind of a big you know, a, a, a number, it's really hard to get a, a grip on what we're talking about, is um, uh, just to kind of compare turf grass to an agricultural crop. In this case, I've chosen sweet corn because uh, sweet corn happens to be the agricultural crop that grows here um, that has the highest needs for, uh, for pesticides. Um, and so it, with a typical lawn care service in Massachusetts, um, because that's where, where I am, um, uh, the typical lawn care company is putting out about five to seven pounds per acre of pesticides uh, annually. Um, whereas sweet corn, which really requires a lot of pesticides, only sees about two and a half pounds per acre. Um, so a real pesticide heavy crop like sweet corn uh, is, you know, less than half the amount of pesticides are being applied to that crop uh, than the, the turf grass that your kids are rolling around on, that your dog is, uh, is playing in. It's just something that we need to think about, especially in light of the fact that, you know, many of these pesticides are, are known carcinogens. Um, so this is a fact sheet from an organization called Beyond Pesticides um, that shows, you know, roughly 14 of the top 30 um, uh, lawn chemicals that are used are either known carcinogens or at least uh, irritants, skin irritants. Uh, they cause kidney and liver damage. They're neurotoxins. Um, you know, these things are, are uh, um, all over our environment. We use them quite readily without even thinking about it because a lot of times they're just blended into a bag of fertilizer, um, but they really uh, have pretty disastrous effects. And there's things that we should absolutely be using a lot more sparingly. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is to not have a lawn. Um, so let's think about fertilizers for a minute because I, we, we don't think about uh, fertilizers as pollutants enough in my mind. Um, in the Northeast, lawns are always going to need fertilizer. You're never going to be able to keep that pristine, perfect uh, turf grass without, um, without some for added fertility. Um, so uh, in terms of the amount of fertilizer that we apply in this country, um, we put out about 20 million uh, tons uh, of fertilizer annually, and about 3 million of those tons are dedicated to turf grass. So when you think about the vast swaths of you know, agricultural land in the Midwest and in California and other parts of the country, um, uh, uh, roughly a seventh, I guess, uh, of that material is, is uh, of those fertilizers are being put out on lawns by oftentimes by homeowners who don't really know exactly what they're doing and make some mistakes that turn those fertilizers into uh, more more polluting than they could be. Um, so in New England, fortunately, we have um, some fairly new fertilizer regulations. Um, four of the six New England states have passed a fertilizer law of some um, shape or form. Um, so if you're in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, or uh, New Hampshire, you have a fertilizer law in the books that impacts you and your ability to use fertilizers at home. It impacts professionals and their ability to use uh, fertilizers in the landscape. Um, if you're in Rhode Island or Vermont or, or Maine, I'm sorry, uh, then there is no fertilizer regulation on the book as of yet. Um, but you should definitely spend some time looking into uh, these fertilizer regulations. This is an excerpt from the Massachusetts law. Um, in Massachusetts, the fertilizer law really focuses specifically on phosphorus-based fertilizers. Um, it makes it illegal to apply a phosphorus-based fertilizer to um, a lawn that doesn't need it. 
Uh, in other words, you have to do a soil test and see that phosphorus is a limiting factor before you can apply um, phosphorus. And there are penalties um, for applying things without, uh, essentially without a prescription. Um, so I encourage all of you to go and look into your state's fertilizer laws, um, see what they entail, because these are fairly new and not a lot of people understand or recognize that they're, they're on the books. And unfortunately, enforcement is pretty limited um, to this point. Um, finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, fossil fuels and emissions. Um, a typical lawnmower running for about an hour is equivalent to uh, driving about 100 miles in a mo more modern car. Um, you know, lawnmowers aren't held to the same high standards that, uh, that automobiles are um, for emissions, so they're still spewing plenty of, uh, plenty of toxins uh, and they're, they're, um, they're much, you know, dirtier burning than, than a typical car is. Um, and so just let's put this into a bit of perspective. I'm sure most of you remember uh, the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, uh, up, you know, off the coast of Alaska, um, that spilled about 10 million, 10.8 million gallons of raw oil um, into the into the ocean. Um, in this country, apparently, and this is a, a, a stat that I found uh, that was put out by Duke University, we we spill about 17 million gallons of gas uh, um, each year, just filling our lawn care equipment. So you know, every time you fill up that tank. Uh, you're, you're spilling a little bit of gas uh, and that amount, which doesn't seem like much, amounts to about 17 million gallons annually. Um, so huge amount of, uh, of, of um, pollution getting into the atmosphere in terms of emissions and also in terms of gas and oil just being spilled. Um, people aren't all that careful when they're uh, filling up their, their equipment or cleaning their filters and that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, you know, um, uh, organic um, uh, land management actually helps to sequester carbon um, and you know we want to try to do as much as we can to capture uh, atmospheric carbon and soil uh, and you know lawn care uh, using fertilizers and 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 other um, practices like this uh, limits the, the soil's ability to uh, to actually chap capture that carbon um, the last point that I'd like to make uh, about the environmental consequences of lawn care is kind of a difficult one, and, and I, I get funny looks when I when I talk about this. But um, you know, I'm sure many of you on the line, are, or all of you, are, are familiar with the um, the concept of invasive species. Um, you probably, if you're in the Northeast, live in a state that at least has some kind of a ban on certain invasive plants um, for the nursery industry. Uh, Massachusetts was the first state in the country to to uh, to have a list of banned plants that couldn't be sold um, sometime in the 90s. Invasive plants or invasive species are a real environmental uh, catastrophe and something that we should be doing uh, as much as we can to control and to prevent. Um, I, I like to try to, you know, get people to think about um, the typical American lawn as, as uh, you know, in the same light, at least, as we think about invasive species. So let's think about the definitions that are out there for invasive species. Uh, one is the NRCS definition. It's a plant that's both non-native, cool season European turf grasses, and able to establish on many sites, um, grow quickly, and spread to the point of disrupting plant communities or ecosystems. Now, if you remove our, our, us from the equation for a second and you know, don't think about us as the vector for how these uh, cool season turf grasses are spread, um, lawn really fits the bill, right? Uh, so you know, the uh, non-native cool season turf grasses are established on many sites, they grow quickly, and they're certainly disrupting plant communities or at least occupying space that uh, natural plant communities or ecosystems could exist in. Uh, when you think about this other definition um, that was uh, part of this presidential executive order, uh, uh, invasive species is again non-native um, to the ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So when you think about all the things that we just reviewed in the last series of slides, you know, I think it's pretty clear that lawns cause economic and environmental um, harm. Uh, they certainly cause harm to human health when we think about all the pesticides um, that we apply on them and the dangerous uh, uh, threat that those pesticides pose. Um, so, you know, I'm not... I'm not saying that lawns are invasive species. It's kind of hard to make that argument, um, but I am saying that we should at least consider them in the same vein, uh, and we should really use them sparingly. And if anything, we should be trying to remove uh, this as the as the you know prototypical uh, American landscape feature in our in our um, gardens and our landscapes as much as possible. Um, and then finally, you know, 
above and beyond all of this is just the idea that lawns are just so drab and boring and sterile. Um, I can't tell you how uh, much the, the image on the right just makes me want to run away. Um, you know, this, this really nice home with two acres of lawn out in front that's really there for no one or no purpose other than to say, I've got a lot of land, I've got a lot of money, and I like to throw it around, and I like to waste uh, natural resources. Uh, at least that's what it says to me. Um, and so, you know, I think we can do a much better job with our gardens and our landscapes. Um, okay, so I've talked a lot about why lawns are bad. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how to get rid of your lawn sustainably, because I think it's important that we, if we're, if we're at a point where we're ready to get rid of some of our lawn, uh, that we think about how to do this without um, causing unintended environmental consequences. How do we do this in as sustainable a manner as possible? Um, so here are some of the techniques that I'm going to cover. Um, solarization, mechanical removal, chemical removal, um, uh, sheet mulching, and then finally stasis. So let's go through each of these in a little bit of detail. Um, solarization is very simply, you know, creating a, a sort of steam-baked uh, environment um, to kill off really any weeds that might be present in a, in a soil. Um, so, you know, you can uh, solarize using clear plastic or black plastic. The idea is you're trying to create a miniature greenhouse effect in the soil uh, that's uh, in the spot where you're trying to either kill a lawn, kill uh, an invasive weed that might be uh, present. Uh, this is a really effective way of, of, of killing vegetation in soil. Um, and it's definitely the one that I would advocate uh, you look to uh, more so than many of the others because I, I happen to be a pretty lazy gardener. This is a pretty passive um, way of, of killing a lawn off. Um, you know, lay some uh, plastic out and let sunlight and heat essentially do the work for you. Um, if you are trying to kill an area of lawn, it's important to mow and water uh, beforehand. Remember, this is this is essentially steam pasteurization, so that moisture is very important. It's really important to make sure that there's some moisture in there um, to drive that steam cycle. Um, it, you also need to think about creating a, a wa water and airtight seal, um, so you have to bury the edges of the plastic. Uh, you can see in this image here, um, we were trying to kill off some uh, pervasive weeds here in a section of garden in the woods, and we were using experimenting, experimenting actually with both black plastic and clear plastic, um, but you can see all the edges are buried um, and that we've got a nice tight uh, seal so that the, the steam essentially stays in place. Um, it takes about six weeks to kill a turf grass, so as long as you don't mind seeing uh, you know, some clear plastic out in front of your house or behind your house um, for about six weeks over the summer, this is definitely a very effective way to kill off a lawn. Um, Oftentimes the questions that I get from people are, uh, what happens to all the soil microbes um, using this process? And the reality is those soil microbes might go dormant for a time, um, but as soon as the plastic is removed, um, what I would advise is to just spread a little bit, of, a thin layer of compost uh, on, on top of the soil um, and your microbial activity will come right back to where it was beforehand. So uh, this, this practice will not kill off many soil microbes. It will uh, just cause many of them to go dormant. Um, and if you kind of reintroduce a, um, a nice healthy soil environment quickly after doing this, uh, they'll, they'll come bouncing back pretty fast. Um, another option is mechanical removal. Um, so you can do this either by renting a sod cutter from a local hardware store, uh, using a shovel, using a fork. Um, the idea behind uh, mechanical removal of, of a lawn is that you really need to make sure that you're removing the crown. Um, so it's not enough to just remove the, you know, the, the above ground portion of the lawn. You also have to make sure that you dig down a little bit um, and, and get the crown of the plants. Fortunately, lawns are not very well, uh, not deeply rooted. Um, so it's oftentimes pretty simple to get the entire crown. Um, I would definitely recommend using something like a sod cutter um, as long as you have a pretty rock free and, and flat level uh, piece of, of turf. Um, the, the downside to using any kind of mechanical removal at all is that any disturbance really is going to lead to uh, weed germination. Um, you're also going to lose a little bit of soil. Um, so if you think back to solarization, um, there, you know, there, there's disturbance certainly, but the, uh, the act of solarization actually 
um, produces enough heat and steam to kill off most weed seeds. Um, so that weed seed presence is, is gone by using solarization, whereas mechanical, um, you're sort of drumming up that, uh, that seed bank that might be in place in the soil and you're inviting uh, those weed seeds to germinate. So, um, you know, this is pretty quick. Solarization takes six weeks. Mechanical removal might take an afternoon or, or a, a nice long weekend, um, uh, but it definitely has some downside and some consequences. Um, let's talk a little bit about chemical removal. I think, you know, based on what I, what you heard me say in these earlier slides about uh, lawn chemicals and herbicides um, uh, and, you know, fungicides, insecticides that we use on lawns, I'm, I'm very anti, um, uh, very anti-pesticide, but I think that sometimes uh, chemical removal um, can be the, uh, a pretty sustainable way to, uh, to, um, rid yourself of lawn. Um, so let's think about this for a second though. Um, if you're using chemical removal, it's important to use a broad spectrum herbicide um, because every lawn has a few weeds in it. Um, so you wanna use something that's gonna um, kill off the lawn and kill off any of those weeds that might be there. Um, and let's just analyze a little uh, the idea of organic um, herbicides. I think oftentimes organic products get sort of greenwashed. Um, they're you know, thought to be safer and, and less um, environmentally harmful, and sometimes that's not always the case. Um, so here's a couple of um, uh, well-known or at least uh, well-used um, organic herbicides. One is called clove oil. Um, unfortunately, clove oil is a known carcinogen, so it's something that you really, if you're going to use it, need to be very careful with. Um, it's, it's a known carcinogen, and, you know, many of our other um, uh, chemical herbicides are as well. Um, so it's just to, you know, sort of provide evidence that you need to be just as careful with an organic herbicide as you do with an, in an inorganic or synthetic herbicide. Um, and then another is acetic acid, which is just really highly concentrated um, vinegar, essentially. Um, acetic acid has a lower LD50 than glyphosate. So glyphosate is Roundup. Um, LD50 is the, the lethal dose that uh, causes 50 of uh, you know, uh, lab rats basically to, um, to, to die. Um, so glyphosate is essentially safer in terms of acute toxicity than acetic acid, which is a, a you know, well-known and well-used organic herbicide. So it's really important to do your research, understand what you're dealing with, uh, you know, when you're using or selecting chemicals, whether they be organic or, or synthetic. Um, the, the good thing about chemical removal is that this is certainly one of the fastest ways you can uh, get rid of a lawn. It's very effective. Uh, it doesn't uh, cause disturbance like the mechanical removal does. Um, and oftentimes uh, this can actually help to build um, organic soils because all the, uh, the, the vegetation that you've killed off by chemical means is now there to uh, drive the soil food web and to pro provide organic matter to the soil. Um, so, you know, there's some pluses and minuses to all of these methods. Um, another method is smothering or sheet mulching. Um, you can do this with a, a temporary um, uh, material like landscape fabric. Landscape fabric is just, uh, you know, a black woven mesh, black woven plastic mesh um, that you can put on an area for, you know, a period of maybe up six months to a year. Um, it will eventually just choke out that lawn um, simply by, you know, laying over it and limiting its ability to get sunlight. Um, another option, one that I would prefer over that previous option is um, to do something we call sheet mulching. Uh, this is where you put down a, a, a thick layer of cardboard, you know, a couple sheets of cardboard uh, on top of themselves in that entire area of lawn that you're trying to kill. Um, and then on top of that, add layers of compost, mulch, maybe leaf litter, maybe wood chips. Uh, and, you know, really what you're doing here is you're um, killing off the lawn or whatever vegetation it is you're trying to kill um, and also building healthy, organic, uh, fertile soils. Um, so I've seen a lot of people who will um, plant, you know, trees and shrubs into a lawn and then sheet mulch around them. Um, kind of a nice way to get an instant, uh, you know, uh, at least an instant start to a garden. Um, and this is a very slow method. It takes a long time for, uh, for this to really work, um, but it's very sustainable. Uh, you know, you're not using any chemicals. Uh, you're, you're, you know, essentially doing this once and then walking away and building healthy soils over a period of many months or, or a year or two. Um, and so it's a, a quite sustainable method. 
method, um, quite effective method, but it certainly takes a long time. Uh, this is probably the slowest of all the methods that I've mentioned. Um, finally, one of the, um, the methods for uh, reducing lawn that I actually think mo more people should try to adopt is just, just stop mowing and see what happens. Um, we, uh, so when I, when I started working here at New England Wildflower Society, our uh, native plant nursery, Nasami Farm, had several acres of turf grass that was mowed um, by a contractor. And I, I, I came in and said, hey, why are, we, why are we doing this? Why do we have so much lawn? There's really no reason for us to have any of this lawn. It's not serving any useful function. We're not using it for parking. We're not using it as growing space. Um, why are we doing this? And no one could answer my question. So I immediately said, okay, let's stop. Let's just mow the edges, uh, you know, around the parking lot, uh, those key spots that are important for people coming in to do some shopping at the garden center. Um, and we did. And what, what we found was we had a really nice tall grass meadow um, just waiting to grow. Um, and so, you know, there's, um, there, there oftentimes homeowners associations have regulations about what you can and can't do. So certainly you need to look into that. Um, but there's no reason to, uh, to do anything more than just stop mowing your lawn and see what happens. Um, control, you know, any, uh, weeds like thistle or other things that might come in that you don't really want to see. Um, just spot treat them, you know, remove them. If you must use a little bit of glyphosate or something like that to, um, to, to get rid of them. Um, if you want to add a little bit more diversity, you could buy some seed packets. Uh, you know, there's, there's many nurseries that sell wildflower seed packets and native wildflower uh, seed mixes. You could just um, spread some, you know, dormant um, seed mixes across a lawn and let it go and see what happens. Or if you wanted to do something a little bit more quickly, um, you could plant perennial plugs, which are just, you know, smaller plants, basically. You plant a lot of them out in different, uh, different areas of the lawn and just kind of let it go and see what happens. You know, experiment a little bit. This is a very fun way um, to get rid of a lawn. Um, oftentimes neighbors uh, sort of look at you funny when you stop mowing your lawn. But I find if you mow an edge or, you know, mow a path through it or something like that, just so, it, you know, you can send a signal to your neighbor that, hey, I haven't, I'm not just neglecting my uh, landscape. I'm actually doing this purposefully. This is what I want my landscape to look like. Uh, you know, sometimes that can turn into some, some conversation piece uh, to, to uh, start to talk to your neighbors about, you know, why are they maintaining so much lawn? Um, so I, I think this is a really effective way to move from, lawn to wildflower meadow without really a whole lot of effort um, and it's a it's you know just a, a really great uh, approach if you're experimental and um, okay with you know doing some experimentation at home rather than just having a quick fix like some of the other um, solutions we talked about all right um, so your lawn's gone now what do you do um, so it, uh, anytime you're building a garden, it's important to really understand what your garden has to offer. I'm going to give you a list or, you know, several uh, lawn alternatives, um, sort of good, you know, mat forming perennial ground covers that I think work really well as, as lawn replacements, um, but they might not work for your particular site. And so it's important that you, you know, understand what your garden has to offer in terms of soil, water, sun, shade, um, find plants that suit your site that are, you know, native to uh, your area. So match the cultural properties of your site to the cultural needs of plants um, to add them to your garden. And then finally, find plants that will thrive without inputs like irrigation, fertilizer, pesticides, without a whole lot of care once they're established. Um, our approach to uh, building out gardens here at Garden in the Woods is always to uh, build gardens that don't need, need irrigation water after establishment. That establishment period might be three months, it might be three years, it depends on the plants that we're working with, um, but I think it's important to you know, not expect that we're always going to be able to water uh, and to do our best to be sustainable, you know, real stewards of the land um, by, by not building a garden that's going to constantly need irrigation water once it's established. Um, so a uh, couple quick things. What makes a plant native? Um, we're New England Wildflower Society. We focus on native plants, at least uh, native New England plants. Um, so just a quick kind of conversation about that. Um, typically, there's two factors uh, involved with determining whether something's native to a particular area or not. I should also mention that native always has to have a qualifier. Uh, you might be talking about a Massachusetts native or a Rhode Island native or native to uh, the eastern United States or native to 
New England, whatever it is that you're dealing with, you know, whatever your uh, your your classification system is, it has to be qualified. Um, so for us, it's pretty easy to point to European settlement and say anything that was here at the time that the first European settlers arrived is considered native. Um, uh, and so, and then the other thing is method of introduction. So natural migration versus human introduction. Uh, is this a plant that was, you know, planted here by early settlers? Is this a plant that was brought from Europe? Is this a plant that was brought from North Carolina, northward? Um, and so for our purposes here at Garden in the Woods, we focus on native plants as being those that existed in the ecoregions of New England at European settlement, not just within the political boundaries of New England, but these more ecological boundaries, as you can see depicted in this image here. Um, and then finally, why native? Uh, well, for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about already this afternoon. First, when properly sited, native plants don't need fertilizer and irrigation. Um, they provide critical habitat for native pollinators and wildlife. They're basically the, you know, the beginnings of an ecosystem. Uh, they help to establish a unique sense of place. Um, they're stunningly beautiful, and finally, they're adapted to New England's climate, soil, water, and ecology. Um, so, you know, choosing natives doesn't mean your garden will be successful. Um, you still have to make sure that you're planting the right plant in the right place, uh, but choosing natives is definitely a, long, a good step in the right direction toward making sure that the plants you choose will work well in your garden. Um, so let's look at some of these plants that I think really work well as, as lawn alternatives. My first and probably favorite is Fregaria virginiana, which is wild strawberry. We have a wild strawberry lawn here at Garden in the Woods underneath our orchard, and I would definitely encourage uh, you to come out and, and check it out sometime if you haven't already. Um, this is a, a New England native species. It grows to about six or eight inches tall. It likes well-drained soils. It's very drought and compaction tolerant, um, so it is something that you can can actually, you know, uh, you can have an event or a party on it. You can walk through the strawberry patch. Uh, it, it definitely um, can take some foot traffic. Um, in terms of horticultural interest, it's a mat forming perennial. Uh, you know, it's certainly something that can form a monoculture, uh, but can play nicely with other plants as well. Um, it's got great uh, spring um, flower. You know, here's an image of them here. Um, fall color. It actually um, stays evergreen, but turns a little bit of a, uh, of a kind of maroonish um, color in the fall. Edible fruits that are just incredibly tasty, and it's a pollinator powerhouse that supports lots and lots of uh, lepidopterans, which are moths and butterflies. Um, we uh, planted um, wild strawberry in combination with a um, warm season native grass called purple lovegrass several years ago. This is an image of purple lovegrass here. Um, this one gets maybe eight to ten inches tall, um, does best in full sun with well-drained soils. If you've driven through New England and um, you know, in or most parts of the country um, in July or August, uh, you know, along the highway roadsides, you oftentimes see big sweeps of purple lovegrass, uh, just really, you know, uh, great purple color, especially in those um, dry uh, and sort of neglected uh, highway roadside edges. Um, this is a really tough plant. It's salt tolerant, drought tolerant, compaction tolerant, um, easy to establish from seed and can also be established from plugs. Um, and the, the purple to red flower uh, and seed head is just really beautiful, really striking in the middle of the summer. Um, so here's, here's what they looked like a garden in the woods in combination. I should mention that was the wild strawberry um, fruit, obviously. Uh, this was um, the strawberry patch in early spring after it's colored up a little bit later in the season when it's in flower, and then the purple lovegrass um, followed it later out on in the summer. It was a, a really striking display. It looked beautiful um, for about a year, maybe two years, and then the, the wild strawberry completely took over. Um, so it, it was not the greatest combination. It looked great for a little bit, um, and that was nice to see, but, um, but the combination itself isn't, isn't all that great because the wild strawberry is a little too aggressive. Um, but the wild strawberry itself forms a really nice uh, mat and just looks, looks uh, really great as a lawn alternative. Um, this is another one that looks very similar to wild strawberry. This is barren strawberry. 
Um, so it's a cousin to the wild strawberry. This used to be wild stenia for those of you who are familiar with this plant, now it's geum. Um, this one is tolerant of a pretty wide range of soil and light conditions. It can grow in some shade. It can definitely take full sun. Um, has uh, spring flowers that look like strawberries, except that they're yellow. Um, really uh, very nice glossy foliage. Um, it's not as vigorous a spreader as wild strawberry, but it is definitely a, a spreading plant. Um, and will form a nice dense mat over time. So it works well uh, if what you're really looking for is a nice evergreen cover to occupy um, a, a space in your garden. Really works well as a lawn alternative. Um, gets to be about six to eight inches tall. Um, here's a, an image of it at the base of an oak tree. Um, and like I said, it takes sun to shade. It uh, really works well in a range of conditions. Um, maybe the perhaps the best um, turf grass alternative in, in our native palette is Carex Pennsylvanica or Pennsylvania Sedge. Um, this one, uh, like the strawberry and the GM, grows to about six to eight inches tall. Um, it, it prefers um, some shade. So you'll see it naturally growing in the understory of like a dry oak forest. Um, so it likes well-drained soils. It's, it's the perfect uh, turf grass alternative for dry shade, which tends to be a pretty um, tough place to keep a lawn. Um, it's stoloniferous, so it's a very dense spreader. Um, and it can be mowed for a neater look. You see it's a little floppy, kind of moppy looking here. Um, you can see it pretty moppy in the uh, image here, which, you know, if, if all you're looking for is green space, this looks great. Um, but you can also certainly mow it. This is a picture that was taken a few weeks after it was mowed. Um, our Carex lawn here at Garden in the Woods gets mowed once a year um, just to kind of keep it neat and tidy. Um, and we have it uh, as an event space. We hold an annual event on this lawn. Uh, and so it can take some foot traffic, just not uh, not soccer, um, but it can definitely take some foot traffic. Um, here's another image of the Carex. Um, if you're looking for a grass that's maybe a little bit taller than something like Carex Pennsylvanica, then a uh, little blue stem works quite well. Uh, this one, if you're driving through the, uh, you know, any anywhere throughout the Northeast, uh, really anywhere in the U.S., you'll see this um, starting to color up now has a nice kind of purpley blue silvery stem. Um, so Schizocarium sc scoparium, little blue stem, gets to be about two to four feet tall, um, tolerant of uh, pretty droughty, uh, well-drained soils, definitely wants to grow in full sun. Um, this is an upright warm season grass um, that doesn't flop over like a lot of other warm season grasses. So if you can tolerate a lawn alternative that's a little bit taller, um, it puts on a pretty impressive uh, winter show and also just looks really stunning in the fall. Um, another one that's similar to the GM that I mentioned before is uh, Chrysogonum virginianum, and this is, or Gold Star or Green and Gold, goes by a number of different common names. Uh, this gets maybe 6 to 12 inches tall altogether. Um, it's a, a plant that, like the GM, can take a range of different soil moisture and light conditions. Um, we have it growing here in the shade. We have it growing in full sun. Um, dry soils, wet soils uh, can pretty much take a, a good range. It's not a very aggressive spreader, but certainly forms a nice dense mat uh, over time. Um, this one blooms for a really long time. We actually have some blooming in the garden now. It's typically a spring bloomer, um, but it'll bloom periodically throughout the, throughout the summer. Um, and sometimes, occasionally, you'll get a flower that'll last straight through the winter. Um, as you can see from the flower, it's, uh, it's an aster relative, so it's in the aster family. Uh, one of my favorites is Sabaldiopsis tridentata, the three-toothed syncofoil. Um, this is a, a plant in the rose family. It's a, sh it's a shrub, actually. has a woody stem. It's evergreen. turns a nice maroonish uh, color in the winter. has these great um, you know, rose-like flowers on it in spring kind of blooms sporadically throughout the summer. Uh, this is a plant that's really very tough, takes, you know, salt, um, takes really uh, poor soils, uh, and forms a very dense mat that's really hard for other plants to grow up uh, in between it. So it's a, a you know, good, good competition, good for keeping weeds down. Um, I just think this is a perfect uh, parking lot plant and a, a, a great solution for uh, an area that is otherwise, would otherwise be turf grass. Um, another good um, uh, mat forming perennial is wild ginger or sarum canadense. This one is, uh, is deciduous, so it's going to lose its leaves in the fall. Um, so not like the glossy evergreen uh, European gingers. Um, 
but um, but it is a really nice uh, 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 mat forming perennial that has really attractive foliage throughout the year. Gets to be about six to eight inches tall. Um, there's a picture of what the foliage looks like, and on the left hand side, left bottom corner, you can see what the flower looks like. You really have to look for the flower because it blooms beneath the foliage. Um, uh, another great solution uh, for a uh, mat forming perennial with some otherwise seasonal interest is Pacara abovada. This used to be a plant called Senecio, now it's called Pacara uh, running groundsel. Um, this puts out a flower spike to maybe 12 to maybe 18 inches tall. Um, in early spring, these brilliant yellow flowers. Um, this is another one that takes a range of cultural conditions from sun to shade, moist to wet to ri uh, rich soils. Um, so it doesn't like dry, but it, it uh, really, you know, would like to be on the sort of moist to wet side. Um, it's a great mat forming perennial. It's evergreen, um, puts out, uh, you know, a flush of spring growth that's, uh, that's kind of purplish, purply tinged. Um, before it fades to green. If you look in the image on the right, what you see are the flower buds um, up toward the top of the image. Um, so the flower buds are this, you know, rich purple, and then all of a sudden they open to this blazing yellow, which is really nice to see. Um, and it does that early in the spring. Um, another kind of taller warm season turf alternative is uh, prairie drop seeds, Spirobolus heteroleptus. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, warm season grasses, has really nice kind of delicate fine textured foliage and a mounting habit, habit uh, really delicate flower spikes, good fall color. Um, and here's an image of a, of a great lawn at Chanticleer, which is a garden in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Um, this is just a, a Spirobolus monoculture. Um, they burn this occasionally, uh, but it doesn't necessarily need to be burned. You could mow this maybe once a year just to keep it, uh, it kind of tidy or just not and let it go. Uh, but it really works well as a, as a uh, turf grass alternative, I think. A um, couple that are sort of on the fringes, uh, hay-scented fern, which I know is the bane of many a gardener's existence, um, but really works well as a, as a mat-forming perennial. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, going to die back to the ground for the winter, so it's not an evergreen. Um, but, you know, in a natural landscape one like the one on the left with carrots in the foreground and hay-scented fern in the background, I mean, this really works well as a lawn alternative, I think. Uh, and there's probably some merit there. Um, uh, in, uh, another option for a fern is, is Christmas fern. Uh, this is an evergreen um, fern that looks fantastic straight through the winter. Uh, I just love seeing those fern fronds poking up through, uh, you know, after the winter snows have melted. Um, very drought tolerant, uh, you know, eight to ten inches tall, uh, and just really works well as a as a uh, lawn alternative because it spreads and you know forms a nice dense mat. Um, and then one that's a little bit more aggressive than most people might like is anemone canadensis, the Canada windflower, um, which gets to be about 12 to 18 inches tall. This is not one to plant anywhere that you want anything but Canada windflower um, because it is a very aggressive spreader. Um, it's rhizominous, so it'll spread um, quite a bit, but will certainly work well as a lawn alternative and gives you some pretty striking uh, winter flowers. Um, another one that people oftentimes consider a weed is wild sarsaparilla. Uh, Aurelia nudicollis. This gets to be 12 to 18 inches tall, has uh, really beautiful spring emergence, as you can see in this image here, uh, and some very attractive fruits. And if you're looking for uh, something in the you know 12 to 15 inch range, um, just to hold maybe a, a bank in place um, without having to really worry about it too much, without having to mow it, um, then Aurelia nudicollis is a, is a really good solution, I think. Um, Another one of my favorites is bearberry, Arctostaphylos uva ursi. Um, this gets to be three to eight inches tall, um, glossy evergreen foliage, um, does best in full sun with very well-drained soils, extremely drought tolerant, um, and has these just amazing, uh, very persistent red fruit um, straight through the winter. Um, so this one, like Sabaldiopsis that I mentioned earlier, turns kind of a maroon purplish. Um, over the winter and, you know, just forms a really dense mat. Um, you could you could easily see an entire lawn of Arctostaphylos, um, and it's just a fantastic plant as a lawn alternative. Um, it looks great in the winter. Um, and then finally, for some um, great spring color, here's a couple of mat forming perennials that do uh, best in shade with a little bit of uh, moisture. Uh, wild blue phlox is a, a native ground cover phlox you can see here in the image. Very fragrant flower, um, so and it blooms at exactly the same time as uh, foam flower, Tiarella, 
uh, which you can see is the white flower in this image. Um, Phlox de Vericata is uh, best in parts on the full shade, um, really likes rich soil, so not something that's going to do well in, in droughty soils at all, um, but has a, a brilliant um, blue flower, uh, evergreen foliage, um, and foam flower, T. relicortifolia. Uh, these two plants just look amazing in combination. Uh, they, they're, they're sort of a bulletproof um, spring display. We have thousands of them here at Garden in the Woods, and they always put on a stunning show. Um, Tiarella has, uh, uh, you know, great foliage character. You can see it here on the right. Um, and the two flowers just look amazing together. It's a, a beautiful spring display. Um, one thing that I did want to mention is um, uh, foam flower grown from seed. Uh, has a lot of different interesting character. So these are uh, six different um, leaves from six different foam flower plants that I took in a matter of maybe two or three minutes here at Garden in the Woods. You can see some of them are glossy. Some of them have deep uh, lobes uh, or deep sinuses between lobes. Some of them have some modeling on them. Uh, uh, you know, one looks kind of like a maple leaf. Um, just really nice variable character in the in the foliage. Um, if you you know opt for plants that have been grown from seed, um, and so you know in addition to those great spring flowers, uh, you can also get some really interesting and diverse um, sort of leaf characters uh, in a in a big stand of foam flower. Um, and this is what that landscape treatment looks like um, in in the height of spring. Right now, it's a you know dense evergreen ground uh, ground cover. Um, so, it, you know, if you're looking for something that's a, a lot more interesting than a lawn um, and you have a shadier um, spot, then I think this is a really good way to do it. Um, I did want to mention at this point, I'm near the end of the presentation. If you have any questions and you haven't had a chance to um, to ask them yet, yet, then please uh, um, put them into that question bar. And Penny Lewis, our moderator, uh, is, is compiling all those to ask at the end of the presentation. Um, if you want more information about most of the plants that I covered today, you can find them on uh, our um, native uh, flora, Go Botany. Um, it's just gobotany.newenglandwild.org. Um, lots of information about where plants are native to. So if you're interested, if you know if if Phlox de Vericata is native to your county or native to your state, then you can search for that on Go Botany. Uh, it's a really handy resource for identifying keying out plants that you might not be familiar with. Um, it doesn't provide any horticultural information. Um, you have to look for other resources to do that. Um, but it is a, a really handy resource if what you're looking for is, you know, just information about what's growing in your, uh, in your garden, in, your, in the forests around you. Uh, and if you're looking to try to identify a plant that you found growing someplace nearby. Um, so just to summarize, why kill your lawn? Well, American lawns are wasteful, environmentally damaging, boring, and sterile. They require excessive inputs of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. And there are myriad ways we can replace our lawns and our landscapes. Um, and I really feel that our garden should contribute positively to, the, to our environment. And one easy way to do that is to kill your lawn. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions, Penny. All right, Mark, thank you. That was a, a great amount of information. And, and we do have several questions. The first couple of questions are on solarization. You mentioned that you use both black and clear plastic was one better than the other in your experiment? Yeah, I'm sorry for not making that clear. Um, clear plastic is definitely the, the more effective method. Really what you're looking for is that greenhouse effect. And it seems like black plastic is good at absorbing heat, um, but it doesn't transmit as much sunlight. And so you're really kind of limited in terms of uh, the heat development that you get with black plastic. Um, so you know both work, but clear plastic is definitely the winner. Okay, and a follow-up. Or can you put mulch on top of the clear plastic to just disguise it while it's doing its work, or would that inhibit the, the solarization? Yeah, you really can't because what you're looking for is uh, sunlight um, to penetrate the plastic. So any, if you put anything on top of it, that'll just negate the effect. Um, but you could use you know, sheet mulching or uh, you know, some other method. Um, if, if you find that the, the clear plastic is, uh, you know, is, it isn't really the right fit for you, uh, I, think, I think there's, you know, several other options, but it definitely needs to be clear uh, without anything on top of it. All right. Uh, can you recommend ground covers for under nut trees, specifically uh, black walnut and shagbark hickory? 
Yeah, I mean, black walnut's tough just because it's um, it's allelopathic and will will kill off a lot of different uh, uh, different plants. Um, if if uh, the person asking wants to send me an email, um, then I'd be happy to send them a list of plants that can tolerate black walnut. Um, but in, in terms of other nuts, um, there's really any of the plants that I mentioned uh, that would work in you know like dry shade. Uh, would work well under under uh, other types of nuts. It's just black walnut that you really need to worry about because it, it does secrete a toxin from its root system. Okay. Uh, one of the questions about some of your tall grass suggestions, have you had an increased incidence of ticks? Um, no, and it, you know, one of the ticks are certainly an issue. Uh, they're always going to be an issue. Um, especially here in the Northeast where we have, you know, just a ton of, of uh, deer tick and Lyme disease is certainly a concern. Um, ticks, ticks bodies really dry out very quickly when they're exposed to sunlight. Um, and so the, the sort of perfect environment for, uh, for most ticks is in that woodland buffer, uh, you know, that sort of shady woodland edge or in the middle of a forest. Um, you know, I, I remember growing up, my, my mom would always tell me not to walk through tall grasses because that's where the ticks were. And mom was wrong. Uh, that's not where most ticks are. Most ticks prefer to be, you know, in the sort of duff layer of a forest, uh, um, you know, that, that sort of like really rich um, kind of moist environment in the understory of a forest. Um, so I wouldn't worry about um, more ticks in tall, in tall grasses. Um, where I would worry about more ticks is, you know, if that's a concern, then I think that's that's going to be more in like a shady kind of woodland garden um, than it would be in, a, in an area with tall grass. All right. Uh, do you have a suggestion for a sloped area around the base of Norway maples? <laughs> yeah, Nor Norway maples are really tough. They're about the worst uh, tree to try to grow anything under. Um, they're also one of the, you know, prime uh, invasive species. So, uh, you know, my first recommendation would be don't plant Norway maple. Um, but my other recommendation would be uh, to look for things that can tolerate dry shade. Um, so of the plants that I covered, um, you know, maybe the uh, uh, GM fragorioides or the uh, chrysogonum um, would both probably work well under Norway maples. Um, the other thing that I would also recommend is to add some organic matter, you know, a thick layer of compost or, uh, you know, leaf litter. Just you really need to um, try to counteract the, that dense fibrous uh, root system of the Norway maple um, to provide more, you know, habit, uh, habitat for the plants that you'd like to grow underneath them. Uh, and the best way to do that is to add organic matter. So compost, leaf litter, uh, even wood chips um, would be fine. Um, just to, to try to add some more, uh, essentially some more depth to the organic layer of the soil. Um, but, you know, either, I, I think GM and, and chrysogonum are both ones that would probably work well under a uh, under Norway. Okay. And a follow-up slope question. Are there any particular plants that you've recommended that are good to maintain uh, erosion control? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, grasses are really great for erosion control. Um, so Spirobolus works well. Uh, the little blue stem would work well. Um, even uh, that Aurelia nudicollis, if it's a shadier spot, would work well. Um, I think, uh, you know, those, those three are the ones that I'd probably most recommend. Um, but a lot of the species that I reviewed are um, mat-forming perennials. And so once established, they're really going to help. Uh, with erosion control. Um, it's just that, you know, some of these others, little blue stem and sprobolus, you can establish from seed. Um, and so it's, you know, probably a little bit of a quicker fix um, for a, a big slope uh, where erosion control is really an issue um, than some of the other plants that you might have to plant, you know, as perennial plugs or two quart pots or something like that. So uh, I would I would look toward the um, uh, sporobolus and little blue stem. Uh, if it's shadier spot, I'd look at uh, Carex pennsylvanica. But uh, I think I think both sporobolus and little blue stem would work best as erosion control in terms of the plants that we reviewed today. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, clarification, please, on the anemone canadensis. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you would only plant it in an area where you did not want anything else. The question is, so does that mean it would not 
play well with others in a meadow mix? Uh, it, it might, it might dominate, um, but I would, I would plant it with other aggressive species. Uh, things like, you know, Asclepias, things like uh, Joe Pieweed, um, depending on the soil conditions, uh, you know, just, I would, I would plant it with other, uh, you know, aggressive species and expect that the anemone is going to, uh, you know, going to be a dominant species um, because it is a very aggressive one. All right. Speaking of aggressive ones, this question is about Pachysandra. Sure. Uh, a neighbor's Pachysandra is invading into this uh, property. Do you have a recommendation for staving off the Pachysandra, Pachysandra and what you might plant to outcompete it? Um, yeah, I would try to probably smother it. Uh, you know, if, if, if you can get to the property edge and, and do some sheet mulching, um, you know, that might be a good solution. Um, you know, Pakistan is actually pretty easy to remove. It's just something that you would have to remove constantly, you know, time and again. Uh, and they're right to ask about competition because the best way to keep it at bay uh, is to provide plenty of competition. And so a lot of the map forming perennials that we went over today uh, are just great uh, competition for Pakistan. Um, in, in, you know, a little bit of sun, the wild strawberry would be great. Your neighbors would then be complaining about your wild strawberry invading their pachysandra. Um, if it's you know a little shadier, then maybe the uh, the barren strawberry would work well. Um, really, I think the key is going to be remove it or you know smother it using uh, like the sheet mulching technique that we talked about, um, and then plant as quickly as possible with a desirable plant that you'd like to see there. Uh, and I think many of the mat forming perennials that can um, that can take some shade would be good. Um, I would shy away from something like chrysogonum uh, only because it's not as ag aggressive and, and it's, it's not going to provide as much competition as either the GM or, you know, in a, in a sunnier spot, the wild strawberry might do. All right. Uh, this is uh, an interesting question. Someone has uh, told this person that they have a white grub problem, but if they go to one of the, options of killing the lawn and the alternative planning that you've recommended, would they have a problem with the white grubs or could they get away with just leaving them? Yeah, you know, I, I, I can't say that I have a ton of experience with white grubs. Um, they are certainly a lawn pest. Um, I think a lot of times, um, you know, the reason that they're a lawn pest is not, not always because of the damage that white grubs do, but because of the damage that like skunks and, and you know, other uh, rodents might do by trying to dig up and get at the white grubs. Um, but I think um, it, just in terms of the, the plants that I recommended, none of them are, you know, susceptible to damage from white grubs. Um, so I, I think you're you're really going to see that that disappears if you opt for something um, besides turf grass. It's just not not a it's not an issue that we deal with with any of these plants. Excellent. So we're coming to the end. We're going to wrap up with two similar questions on uh, recommendations for full sun. One is specifically looking for recommendations for full sun because many of the plants that you showed were partial or shade plants, and the other is recommendations for full sun with clay soil and heavy traffic. Oh, yeah, um, so um, clay soil is tough, but I can, what I'd recommend for uh, that individual is to email me, um, and I will scrounge together a list of plants that I can send them. Um, the other thing that I, um, in terms of um, uh, sun, you know, more sun loving plants is, Sun tends to be uh, an environment with, uh, I guess I would say, taller uh, species. So, um, you know, the, the few that I chose that work well in full sun um, are bearberries, sabaldiopsis, um, uh, even the GM to some extent. Those will really do fine in full sun. Uh, and they're probably my best, uh, you know, those are probably my best, um, my best recommendations for full sun in terms of something that looks uh, more, uh, you know, that, that really works well as a lawn alternative. Um, some of the others that I mentioned, like the uh, little blue stem or the spirobolus, those are both full sun plants, um, but they're uh, a little bit taller. So, uh, and, and, you know, the more you dive into full sun plants, the more you um, find that many of them are very tall um, and many of them are clumpers uh, that don't really work as well as a, as a lawn alternative. 
Um, so I hope that answers um, the question. And the other thing that I'll recommend for that person is to also send me an email and I'll be happy to send them a list of, uh, of other sun loving plants. Uh, with the amount of time that I had, it was tough to get into, you know, a whole lot of detail on a, on a huge list. So I wanted to provide, uh, you know, a pretty short list for people to choose from. All right. Thank you, Mark. This is this has been great. Lots of okay. really, really good options for us. We'll certainly be considering moving beyond traditional lawns.